Again, happy Independence Week. Uh, my name is Lance Beecham. I'm the discipleship pastor. You know, I'm thankful to live in a country where we can gather together and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in freedom. Uh, while our culture is becoming more and more hostile to Christianity, we still are able to enjoy many more freedoms than our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. So I'm thankful to God for the blessings that we enjoy living in this country. I'm also thankful to so many who have given their lives over the past 250 years to ensure our freedom. I'm also thankful to those that continue to put their lives on the line, both here and abroad, to protect the freedoms that we enjoy. I'm proud to be an American. Now, if I start breaking out in some Lee Greenwood, someone please mute my mic before it's too late. Today, we begin a month-long break from our uh, journey through the book of Acts. We started back at the beginning of the year and have gone through chapter 16. And today, we'll, we'll take a break. Uh, next week, we will actually begin a new mini-series uh, called Christmas in July. So uh, I hope you'll be back for that. We'll also be back to three services uh, starting next week. Um, but today, we're going to, in honor of Independence Week, we are going to explore the question, is patriotism biblical? Is patriotism biblical? The short answer to that, and I'll go ahead and take care of it right now, is yes, it is biblical. So I suppose we're done and we can all go home. Uh, in the words of Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. Uh, what we need to figure out is, okay, if it is indeed biblical, what does that look like? How do we navigate the fact that we are both citizens here, but also citizens in heaven? You know, as a Gen X member, I remember the Cold War. Now, some of y'all may not know what the Cold War was. So uh, there's a lot of younger people in the audience, and you're like, Cold War, what, what's that all about? Is that a snowball fight or, or what? Uh, so the United States and the Soviet Union uh, think Russia plus a bunch of other countries, right? Uh, in fact, I have to pause and say, when I took world geography, the Soviet Union took up so much space that that part was fairly easy when I had to do the map quiz. But ever since the Soviet Union fell, now there's like a ton of countries that the Soviet Union used to be. So I will go ahead and admit, world geography quizzes are harder today than when I took them. But during this time of the Cold War, you had America and the Soviet Union, which was a Russia and a bunch of other countries, they were kind of in an arms race against one another and not a whole lot of communication between the two. And so I grew up during the latter part of the Cold War. And as a kid, I was probably about five, year old, five years old, went into my dad's office. My dad had a law practice. And uh, inside his office building, uh, his office was here, and right next to it was his cousin, Greg Beecham, who was his law partner. And I remember my mom taking me to see my dad, and so I, I go in there to the office, and I'm standing right outside the door. And I, I can look right here, and my dad's in his office with his door open, and Greg is in this office right next to it, in his office with the door open. So I look into my dad's office, and I'm, I'm talking to both of them at the same time, and I I look in there, and my dad's office is completely decked out with Florida State stuff everywhere. And I go, that's my best team. In other words, that's my favorite team. I look over into Greg's office, who is decked out in University of Florida Gator stuff everywhere. And I point into his office, and I go, and that's my next to my worst team. And Greg, being the proud Gator fan that he is, and during that time period, he, he had uh, some things to be proud of, uh, he was looking at me with this, this grin on his face and just couldn't help but get, you know, just kind of choked up over or how, you know, what, what would be my worst team? Like, if this is my second to the worst team, what's my worst team? Like, is he thinking Miami Hurricane? What, what is he thinking? So he goes, Lance, you said this is your second to your worst team. What, what's your worst team? And I said, Russia. And that tells you a lot about my childhood and growing up in the Cold War. Maybe it told you more about 
the Olympic ice hockey matchup that was going to be monumental uh, during that time period. But either way, I saw Russia or the Soviet Union as the enemy. And so many people that have come out of the Cold War saw America as this great Christian nation battling against the Soviet bloc of countries which were atheists. And that's kind of the way that it was portrayed. And so there are many people, uh, even today, that will look at this and, and celebrate it to some degree. You know, the Bible Belt South is probably the last place uh, in this country to recognize it, but we are living in a post-Christian country, if we were Christian to begin with. And so there are many people who will celebrate this week as if America is God's chosen people. Too many times we've taken passages like 2 Chronicles 7.14 out of context, which says, if my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. We have to remember, this is not a promise to America. This is a promise to Israel. We can, however, take some principles from what God called Israel to do and apply them not to America today, but to the church today. For example, when the Israelites were in captivity in Babylon, God used Jeremiah the prophet and spoke through Jeremiah to the people that were living in exile there. And he gave specific instructions on what the Israelites were to do while living in captivity. And he says this in Jeremiah 29, verse, beginning in verse 4. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. Basically, what we notice here is that the Lord is saying, bloom where you are planted. They are to live their lives where God has placed them. And they're also to pray to him on behalf of Babylon. Because as Babylon prospers, so will God's people prosper who are living there. While we may not think of ourselves as living in exile here in America, although maybe some of you do, the principle we can take from Jeremiah 29 is that we should pray to God for America to prosper so that we as God's people living here will also prosper. If there was nothing wrong for the Israelites to pray for Babylon, that God would bless Babylon because it would ultimately help them, then surely there's nothing wrong with us asking God to bless America where we are living. At the same time, however, we have to understand that there are believers living in countries all across the globe. And it is equally right for them to pray that God bless those nations that they're living in so that they will be blessed as well. So we've got to keep the right balance. We need to have affection for the place where we find ourselves. We need to have affection for the people that we live among. And we need to make sure that we work towards making wherever God has placed us a better place. We should be politically and culturally engaged. Not only do we see the Israelites uh, being called to be faithful citizens where they found themselves, but we also see that submitting to governing authorities is a New Testament concept as well. Paul wrote to the church at Rome and spoke about this very thing, beginning in verse 1 of Romans chapter 13. Paul says, let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? 
Do what is good, and you will have its approval, for it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, speeding tickets to... No, they didn't say that, but you should. Respect to those you owe respect and honor to those you owe honor. Paul makes the point that while we are here on earth, whatever, wherever God has placed us, we are to recognize and submit ourselves to authority. Sometimes this is easier than others. Some areas of our world, this is easier than others. Obviously, Paul is not going to say submit to governing authorities when what the government is telling you to do runs contrary to God's command. In that case, we appeal to the highest authority, which is God. In the meantime, believers are expected to submit to governing authorities. You know, what makes this stand out so much to us here in America is understanding that Paul wrote this during the time that the Roman Empire was in charge. Not only was the Roman Empire in charge, but Emperor Nero was the one in charge. And Paul is basically saying to submit to him. And if you think about who Emperor Nero was, he ends up being the one in charge when Paul is executed just a few years later after he wrote this letter. As Patrick Schreiner says in his book, Political Gospel, Rome could be both good and bad at the same time. It made roads that furthered gospel expansion, but also persecuted Christians and threw them in prison. Its laws protected citizens, but Rome was no friend of Christianity. Paul was willing to live in this tension. Christians need to follow his example. Now let's reflect on a few questions. Is it easier to pray for God to bless America and to submit to governing authorities in this country when the people you voted for are in office or when the people you voted against are in office? Is it easier to pray for those kind of things when the Democrats are in charge of the executive and legislative branches of our government or the Republicans? Does your patriotism differ based on who holds office? Speaking to Romans 13, Brandon O'Brien wrote an article in Christianity Today on this subject of patriotism, and he says, on the one hand, the scriptures are clear that we are to honor those in authority in our country, but this doesn't have as much to do with politics as with a general principle that Christians are to show honor and respect to those in positions of authority. An another reflection question, does your patriotism toward America motivate you to pray for our leaders regardless of their political party? Look at what Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, and again, you gotta keep in mind, Emperor Nero is in charge. Roman Empire here. So, 1 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, First of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I want to just say, I don't think Paul would have voted Nero into office. The fact is, no one had a vote whatsoever. Yet, Paul encouraged Timothy to pray for kings and all those who are in authority. Furthermore, prayer for leaders extends beyond one's own country to all world leaders and authorities. In verse 1, he says, prayers are to be made for everyone. You know, praying for those in authority allows us to lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity, as he says in verse 1. Have you noticed that when you pray for someone, 
as you give a situation over to God, that your perspective changes, your heart is softened toward that person the more you pray for them. Even when we radically disagree with someone, we can still appeal to the Lord on their behalf. There is a limit to every authority figure's sovereignty, but our God has no limits on His authority. You know God can work in the hearts of anyone He wants, all those in authority. He can change their hearts. But even if He chooses not to, He may still need to work in our hearts in the way we think about those that are in authority. As he does, we're able to live that tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Praying for our leaders, regardless of whether we like them or not, also pleases God our Savior. Verse 3. Now, these are tough questions to consider and tough things that, that Paul is saying. And I have to remind myself of them all the time. And this is something that as I speak these words, this is for me more than anyone else in this room. So we've looked at Paul. Let's look at what Peter says. Peter also emphasizes the importance of submitting to governing authorities. In his first letter uh, in chapter 2, starting in verse 11, Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day He visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by Him, to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So again, God's word here is submit to every human authority because God has sovereignly placed them in their, where they are. Again, the submission is assuming that this human authority is not contradicting what God has clearly commanded. Submitting to human authority by doing good actually points people to the ultimate authority, which is God. This is what Peter is emphasizing here. Furthermore, wherever God has placed us, we are to love and honor those around us. You know, the end of this passage in verse 17, it says to honor the emperor. Again, Nero is the emperor when Peter wrote this. And what's really amazing is we've got to remember that Emperor Nero is the one who is ultimately responsible for the execution of both Paul and Peter. Yet we see both of these men commanding other believers to honor him and to submit to him. I also want to bring your attention to the beginning of the passage in verse 11, where Peter addresses the believers as strangers and exiles. He's referencing the fact that this world is not our home as believers. Even if we have a patriotism for our country, which is clearly biblical, we cannot lose sight of the fact that America is not our true home. We're just passing through. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 3, beginning in verse 18, For I've told, often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body by the power that enables Him to subject everything to Himself. Patriotism is indeed biblical, but it can become idolatrous if we're not careful. Earlier in Philippians 3, Paul lists out all the things that he should be proud of, of his Jewish heritage 
and all the things that he's done right uh, according to the works of the law. But he says, compared to Christ, that's all garbage. Instead, what Paul does is he pursues the heavenly call in Christ Jesus, and he tells the Philippian believers to follow his example. In, in verses 18 and 19 in this passage, Paul is really describing people who are just looking at earthly things, and that's all that matters to them. And he's trying to say, you need to think about beyond this. There is something bigger. So how does this relate to patriotism? Being proud of your country is a good thing. But looking up to a presidential candidate or a political party as the savior this world needs is idolatrous. Looking down on others simply because they are from another country is arrogant. As crazy as it might sound initially, if we truly understand that our citizenship is in heaven, then we have more in common with our brothers and sisters in Christ that are on the other side of the globe than we do the fellow American patriot that lives across the street that doesn't know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Like Paul indicates, as a follower of Jesus, my citizenship is in heaven. This is my true home, and I eagerly wait for the day when Christ Jesus is going to return and make all things right again. However, just like Paul claimed his Roman citizenship as he did in the book of Acts, I can claim American citizenship. This is where God has put me. As Patrick Schreiner says, one citizenship does not cancel out the other, though one is primary. We should neither merge the citizenship of America and citizenship of heaven. We should neither merge these two citizenships, nor should we divorce them. To merge these two would mean that I believe America is God's chosen people, which is biblically untrue. If I divorce these two citizenships and just concentrate on one and forget the other, then I reject being identified with the nation in which I reside, and I neglect the, to pursue the prosperity of the place where God has sovereignly put me. The reality is I am a citizen of both America and the kingdom of God. My priority, however, should be the kingdom of God. Let me give you an example. I have a neighbor who uh, lives right next door to our house. And back during the pandemic, uh, we were out talking kind of in the woodsy area between our two houses. And it did not take long for me to realize that he and I had radically different views on vaccines and masks during the pandemic. And everything in me wanted to have this conversation politically. And there are moments in my life where, where God just kind of tugs on me and says, you just need to keep your mouth shut. And this was one of those moments. And uh, the reason why I kept my mouth shut is I'm like, yeah, maybe I could win an argument over this. But in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter? Is this really something worth getting in an argument with my neighbor, posting a bunch of junk on social media about? Is it really worth it in the end? And the answer is no. Because what I figured out in this conversation with my neighbor, who is not a Christian, is am I willing to sacrifice a future gospel conversation with my neighbor for the sake of winning a political argument. I think that's really stupid. And I'm glad God helped me to understand how stupid that was going to be. And so I didn't say anything. He thought that Tiffany and I were on the same page with him. And I just let it go. Because I didn't want to ruin an opportunity for a future conversation about things that really do matter forever. And so... Hopefully, we will get more and more of those chances as, as time goes along. And so, this is an example of a time when, when I actually listened to God and, and, and didn't speak in when I should have remained silent. And so, this is how we prioritize being citizens of heaven over citizens in America. 
I don't get it right every time. In fact, I, I get it wrong a lot of the time. But may this be an encouragement to you and help remind you of what is truly important. You know, Jesus' prayer to the Father on behalf of his disciples in John 17 focuses on this priority of the kingdom of God. He says in verse 14, I have given them your word, talking about the disciples. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. We are to live as people sent by God wherever he has sovereignly placed us. As long as we remember that this is our temporary home and we prioritize the things of God over the things of this world, then patriotism is biblical. But here are some important balances to keep in mind. On the one hand, be proud of your country. This is where God has placed you. On the other hand, don't let your pride of country make you believe that America is God's chosen people. God has his people all over the globe. Secondly, on the one hand, be actively engaged in politics and culture to make this place a better one. But on the other hand, don't depend on politics and politicians to solve our country's problems. The heart of every political problem is a sin problem, and only the gospel can overcome that. Third, on the one hand, pray for your country, but also pray for other countries. The people of God are certainly not limited to America. In fact, as we see Europe and America slow in their growth in the gospel, the, the, the gospel is having the hardest time growing in America and Europe right now. Elsewhere around the world, in places you can't possibly fathom, the gospel is exploding. Christianity is on the move. And so we've got to understand that the people of God are not limited to this one country. Galatians 3.28 talks about there's neither Jew nor Gentile. In other words, Jesus has leveled the playing field. He doesn't have this country over this country. It is his people all across the globe. Even Revelation 7, 9 gives us a picture before the throne, and it's people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people gathered there. Number four, pray for those in office that you voted for. Pray for those in office that you did not vote for as well. This week, number five, this week, celebrate the freedoms that we enjoy as we remember America's liberation from foreign control. Yet, we should celebrate even more every day the freedoms we enjoy in Christ as we remember our own liberation from the control of sin and death that could only happen, that liberation could only happen because Jesus died in our place and rose again. If you are still in bondage to sin and don't know this freedom, we would love to talk to you after the service in our care room out there. You know, John Piper said, keeping Christ supreme in our affections makes all our lesser loves better, not worse. Under his flag, it is right to be thankful to God that we have a fatherland, a tribe, a family. Now, what does he mean here? He means the key is proper priorities. It's okay to love your country and to be patriotic about it, but understand that your love and devotion to God is over that. It's also key to keep the proper perspective in that we understand that America is not the equivalent of Israel. God's people who are all over the globe are who God's people are, not just American citizens. You know, I read a good book a few years ago that said, we should never preach a sermon that we'd be unable to preach in a different country. Since the scriptures and gospel transcend time, nations, and cultures, sermons should be preached as such. 
You know, if our theology is America-centered, we are misapplying Scripture. The gospel is for all nations and is to go to the ends of the earth, as it says in Acts 1.8. Even this week, we have a missionary team in London that just landed there to share the gospel with people in London, and people come from all over the globe to this global city, London. And so they're able to reach many people uh, there in that city. And so we should be praying for them. It's just ironic that we have this missionary team landing in London, the very place from which we will celebrate our freedom from this week. But let's be reminded that we need to continue to pray for America as well as other nations that God would open the spiritual eyes of people to the truth of the gospel. This indeed is our priority. Let's pray. Lord, I'm just thankful for your love for us, your grace, your mercy, your truth. Lord, that it expands beyond uh, country borders and oceans. Lord, we are thankful that you came to us when we were unable to get to you. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to realize that you have sovereignly placed us where we are and that we would be good citizens wherever that might be in our lifetime. Lord, that we would pray to you and depend on you to bless those places we live so that we are ultimately blessed. But Lord, we also recognize that wherever we are, you are working not just in that country, but other countries as well. Help us keep the proper perspective this week as we look to you, our ultimate Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.